Well, because it's very similar, but we have to decide to answer it. And the way you start to answer it uh, quantitatively is by going back to the formula of P of A and B equals P of A times P of B. Why is that relevant? Because that formula only worked if the two variables are truly independent. And since we give the benefit of the doubt to the A0, when we do all our calculations, and again, you don't know what I'm talking about from stat one, uh, and the, the eight zeros that they're independent, let's use this formula to calculate these numbers two different ways. Once by reality, there were actually four people found here, and once according to the theory, if they were truly independent, how many people would be found here? So let's work it out. What's the chance of somebody being both a, a male and a, pa a person who passes? Well, we know that there, there are four out of 10 people, so the number that goes over here is, I'll put it down here, there are four out of 10 people who fall into that category, a 40% probability. Is that the same as working out the calculation on the assumption of independence? How many people were, this is people who are males and people who are passing. How many people uh, were males? Again, think of 10 people on 10 index cards. You pick out a card at random. What's the chance of picking out a male? Six out of 10, so 60%. And how many people passed? Well, if you pick someone, you know, there are seven people passing, so the chance of 7 out of 10, you're going to pick somebody who passed randomly. So are these two numbers the same or very close? So that's what we're going to try to calculate. So, so you can do 40% times 60% times 70% and check them out. And now 60 times 70 is 42%, so 42% and 40% are similar. This is 0.40. This is 60 times 7, which is 0.42. So they, while they're not exactly the same, they're pretty close, which is consistent with our in initial analysis of the data. But it turns out there's a shortcut, that you don't have to necessarily deal with these fractions, it's much easier to deal with whole numbers. So by multiplying both sides of the equation by the, the grand total you started with, this will basically mean that the tens cancel. So you're back to the number you started with, the number in the box that you're actually given as data to start the problem. And the 10 cancels with the 10. So basically the calculation you got to do is take the number that you actually observe, we call that the frequency that was observed, FO and compare it to the frequency that we actually expect. So six times seven over 10 is 42 over 10 or 4.2. So this 4.2 is the number that I'm gonna put in a circle and it's called the frequency that we expect. Because under the assumption of independence and under the formula that give that, that that's related to that formula, we would expect 4.2 people in that particular box. How many do we actually see? Four, pretty close, but we're gonna to have to do the same calculation for all the cells of the table. These are called the cells of the table. So how many people will we expect in this particular box? We got actually got two, but so the formula says you multiply the number in the row, which is the, to the row total, which is six, times seven divided by 10. In other words, this number here came from six times seven divided by 10. Six times seven divided by 10. Now let's do the same thing here. Without going through the same analysis, the row total is still six, but now the column total is three. So it's gonna be, six times three divided by 10, or 1.8. And notice that the 4.2 plus the 1.8 adds up to the six, that's not a coincidence, it's a useful mathematical fact to use as double check. How many people belong in this circle? Well, let's see, it's gonna be four times seven divided by 10. Four times seven divided by 10, which is 2.8. And finally, here it's four times three divided by 10 is 1.2, and 1.8 and 1.2 adds up to three, 2.8 plus 1.2 adds up to four. So we have the right numbers. Now the question is how do you process those numbers to come up with a single measure of how close the data is to the assumption of in the truly independent, and that's called the chi-squared, the second part of this calculation is called the chi-squared formula, which you add together over all possible cells, in this case there are four of them, the difference between 4.2, the, well let's write down the formula, it's the formula says you, you calculate the frequency, you look at the frequency that was observed, actually that collected that data, minus the frequency that we expected. And if you do that, you're gonna get 4.4, the first observed number is four, minus the ex frequency expected, which is 4.2. And you add to that the same calculation applied to, applied to the second box, which is two minus 1.8. And you do that a third time, three minus 2.8. Um, and finally, you're going to get 1 minus 1 1.2. And now, even though the class is sitting here in an ambiguous situation, anybody know what you get from that? What does that come out to? Well, 
I don't expect you to really get that. The answer comes out to zero. But that's because in any situation, you're going to get zero without going, without spending the time um, to explain that. You're going to always get numbers. Of course, the numbers above and below will cancel out. We've seen that before by the variance. So one way of solving that problem is you square everything. By squaring everything, like we did for chapter three, the variance, we got rid of that, mind, that negative, so the negatives will not cancel with the positives, and you're going to have a real number. The problem by doing that is that, let's say, instead of having 10 people, we had 100 people. Well, if you had 100 people, you'd expect 40 people here and 42 people here, so 40 minus 42 is 2, and when you square the 2, the difference is going to come out to 4. So when you basically, by every time you increase the sample size, the squaring increases everything by a factor squared, which makes the numbers too large. So in order to compensate for that, we change this form, we modify the formula for the last step is you divide it by the number you started with, the FE, so that will sort of cancel out. And I'm not gonna spend too much time in the mathematics. So that basically says you'd calculate, and by the way, I really would appreciate somebody doing me a favor because uh, I don't have time to calculate it. So please calculate this, somebody who, a little bit. And this comes out to 4.2, this comes out to 1.8, this comes out to 2.8, this comes out to 1.2. Now this will come out to definitely a positive number. And so how much is 0.2 squared is 0.04 divided by 4.2. That comes out to like, like 0.01. It'll come out to 0.01. It comes out to also about 0.01. So the whole thing, come, come, I would say, comes out to roughly about 0.03, if I had to take a guess. But if, is anybody calculating it? Anybody being a... Uh, a nice person, I think it comes out to about 0.03, but I could be wrong. Uh, unless somebody, if somebody's doing it slowly, and just not correct it in a couple of seconds. But meanwhile, this comes out to probably approximately 0.03, 0.04. It's gonna come out to, so the question is, how do you decide? Now, if this is perfectly proportional, if the proportions are exactly the same, it's gonna come out to zero. So the question is, how much bigger than zero are willing to allow? And we know by now, again, you don't know, because we're about to start that in chapter nine, but those in stat two, we make, we go to a third step of the hypothesis testing, which is to make a, a, di a diagram which will help us visualize our rejection region. And the chi-square table, similar to the F, can't be negative because it's everything squared. It has a bump at the beginning. There's only a one-tailed rejection region. And the alpha, which is traditionally 0.05, we'll make that over here. The only question, and this will label this reject, label this do not reject A0. And again, for those of you who are trying to make sense out of this, this is what we're about to learn about today, or just beginning today. Um, the degree of freedom Surprisingly, it doesn't depend upon the sample size like it always did, but it depends upon, like it did in chapter, the beginning of chapter 11, the number of rows or columns, R minus one times C minus one, which is the number of rows, in this example, two rows, times the number of columns, which is, oh my God, columns, uh, two minus one, which is equal to one times one or one, and if you go to the back of the book and you look up the 0.05, the first degree of freedom on the chi-square table is 3.841, I recall from class. And finally, you make your, the fourth step where you make your conclusion, 0.03 is clearly in the do not reject region, so the answer is simply do not reject a zero. And in terms of the interpretation, are the, are the two variables related or not? It the the turns out they're, they're totally unrelated, which is really equivalent to saying that the males and females are doing basically the same. So we proved, first of all, that males do equal to the females within a small margin of error, and also that the, as far as the larger question is concerned, the two variables are truly independent. And I would say uh, males equal female is one way of expressing it in this case, or in the more general situation, we basically said there's no relation, I'm sorry, there's no relationship, because the book asks you if there's a relationship or not. There's no relationship, they're, they're truly independent. And Brian,